Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, February 13th. Today's session is Creating Media for Learning with Sam Glicksman. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. Maureen is back. And Maureen is going to introduce Sam for us as well as ask the newbie question. Great. Thanks, Lori. Um, I've been following Sam for years, and it's a great pleasure to introduce him today. Sam Glicksman has been leading innovative technology applications in private industry and education for over 25 years. Recognized as a prominent expert on technology and educational reform, he currently works as an independent technology consultant, speaker, and author. Sam's been a pioneer in promoting the use of mobile technology in education. He has consulted with small schools all the way up to school districts and governments and has just returned from uh, meeting and consulting with the Prime Minister of Greece in Athens. Sam's iPads in Education website, which is iPadEducators.ning.com, has a membership of thousands. I think last time I looked, it was over 8,000 educators worldwide and is recognized as a leading source for the use of mobile devices in education. Sam is an acknowledged expert on iPads, and he was contracted by Wiley Press and wrote the definitive iPad and Education for Dummies book, which many of you have probably seen, back in January of 2013. And this book has been hailed as a primer for anyone interested in the educational applications of mobile technology. Sam recently authored the book Creating Media for Learning, which was published by Corwin Press and released last month. I have a copy, and I've already found great new ideas to try at my school. Sam also speaks at conferences nationally and internationally and gives workshops about the changing nature of education in the digital age. He has recently spoken at conferences and private events domestically and internationally in locations as such as Greece, Turkey, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. A common thread woven throughout Sam's presentations is the need to weave technology use into a more holistic pedagogical approach that addresses the needs of students in the 21st century. Sam is passionate about the need for educational reform. So Sam, I'm going to read you the newbie question, which is, why is it important for students to be involved in media creation? Take it away, Sam. Well, first off, after that uh, incredible introduction, I think uh, I, I have so much to live up to here. I'm not sure I can make it, but uh, let's give it a shot. Uh, welcome, everybody. Why is it important for students to be involved in media creation? Um, really, that's, in essence, what we'll be discussing throughout the session today. Uh, so uh, media has become very much the language of modern communication. And given that, uh, it's something that we really need to emphasize way more in everyday learning. And we'll be looking at lots of different ways to integrate media creation into the learning process today. Uh, if we're ready, um, if uh, you'd like, I can start now. Our topic for today is creating media for learning. And uh, you'll notice there that it's actually the uh, subject also of a book that I've just released through Corwin. And it's about creating media and student-centered projects. You have my contact information there. Uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions uh, or uh, would like to contact me about anything else. Uh, you have my email address, my Twitter account, and so on. You know, there's been a lot of talk in the introduction about augmented reality, and it is actually one of the features of the book and something we'll be discussing towards the end of the seminar today. Uh, it's actually, as far as I know, the first book that actually uses augmented reality throughout the book. And what that means is um, it discusses a lot of student projects, a lot of um, sort of sample media projects. And there are images that represent the project on the printed pages of the book. What you can do is take your mobile device, 
pointed at the printed image and it's as if the video plays right on the printed page. If you haven't seen augmented reality in action, um, hopefully if you have the Daiquiri app, we can get a little taste of it towards the end of the seminar today, but it's just a, it's quite an amazing experience and so you can actually view the videos right within the printed book using augmented reality. So our objective today is to address three questions. Firstly, why should we encourage students to express themselves with digital media? Secondly, what forms of digital media can best be used for learning? And given that we have a short amount of time today, and uh, usually I can go on for like two or three days with workshops on this topic, we'll, we'll get just a, a brief overview of some of the main types of digital media. And lastly, how can we create them? We'll be looking at several examples of student-centered media projects that are from actual classroom use. Now, the first thing I always get when I bring up the topic of digital media is uh, many people assume that it's a topic for art class. Um, you know, they see the word media, and media usually equals arts, and uh, it, it uh, tends to get misplaced. So I want to dispel that myth right from the start here. Every learning initiative requires clear communication, and really what we're talking about today is communicating effectively with media. It's a skill that's required at all age levels and across all academic disciplines, and hopefully you'll get a taste for some of that today as we look through different types of media and some sample projects. And I'd like to start with a, a um, story that came about actually about two years ago. I was giving a workshop in Australia, and by the way, that's not your uh, sound system that's uh, causing it. It actually is an Australian accent you're hearing. Uh, but uh, I was in Australia about two years ago giving a workshop to a, uh, a group of teachers on media creation. And I received a, a phone call from the, the school principal about two weeks later. She told me the story of a boy that had really been struggling. He had learning difficulties and he, he was really struggling in school. And he became so frustrated and aggressive that he actually threw a rock and broke the windshield of the pr principal's car. She called me to let me know that uh, the teachers after the workshop had gone back to their classes and started implementing all these different student-centered media projects. And this particular boy, who totally struggled up until that point, all of a sudden started flourishing. Uh, he, he basically found a language that he could finally use to communicate. And that's not at all unusual. Um, students are communicating with media all the time. And it needs to be clear that I'm not trying in any way, shape, or form to minimize the importance of reading and writing. But the more effectively we all communicate, the more effectively we all learn. And media creation can actually enhance the use of text. It doesn't have to replace it. Um, so let's take a look then at a little bit of history of how technology has actually influenced uh, communication throughout history. Now, if you've ever asked yourself, why is it that most of our learning and communication systems evolved around text? Well, actually, that wasn't the case. It wasn't always the case. About 500 years ago, that all changed with the Gutenberg printing press. Actually, prior to the printing press, most people couldn't read or write. And frankly, there was no need to. There was very little material available for the average person to read. That all changed with the printing press. All of a sudden, uh, people were able to uh, communicate their ideas across the world in, um, in a mass format. So from the 15th century on, it was actually technology that established reading and writing as important literacies, which they remain today. So just as technology pushed text to the forefront of learning, it started to change in the 20th century. We started to see a whole new wave of technology communication in the 20th century, which included radio, telephone, uh, obviously movies, and television. But what has changed dramatically just in the last 15 or 20 years is that we've gone from being largely consumers of media, which is what we were throughout most of the 20th century. Most of us consumed media. Very few people actually produced it. Now, all of a sudden, we see the convergence of two major innovative trends. One is uh, media production is all of a sudden available pretty much to anybody at any time or place through the, the uh, invention of the smartphone. 
It's exploded in the last 10 years. Now, anywhere you are, you can pull out a smartphone and create media at any time. Secondly, we've had the development of social networking, which means that the media that's created can be instantly shared across the world at any time in an instant. So all of a sudden, we find ourselves being producers of media, and we have tools for the personal production and distribution of media available at our disposal all the time. Which brings us to today. We have students that have access to these fantastic media creation tools. But by and large, we're not really changing our model of education to take advantage of this. Text remains important, but remember that text is a vehicle for learning. It's not the objective. Our traditional tools for communicating learning have been the pen, the word processor, but today we can actually utilize media for communication. And there's, there's just uh, so many different ways that you can integrate media and media creation into learning. We're very visual learners, and let's take a look at some of the ways we can actually implement this sort of strategy. We'll start out with video. Now, we love watching video, and obviously, students love creating it. It's actually been shown that um, when you learn, you can actually remember material nine times more effectively when it's in a visual format than when it's either in text or uh, heard. And I say that a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, actually, a video is worth a thousand pictures. And we think of it as, as a, a rather trivial format. Most of the time when we think about video, uh, we tell kids to go off and just uh, go ahead and create a movie, an iMovie. It's something that's sort of trivial, and it's a break from the uh, sort of more rigorous academic processes that we conduct in class. But it actually has so many different subtle elements, and they can all have a significant impact on the message if we take the time to learn how to actually create effective video. You have narration soundtracks, you can utilize camera angles, zooming, so many more things, and they all have a significant impact on the message being communicated. Now, before I actually jump in to looking at how we create the video, let's establish from the start that if you want your project to be rigorous and to have great academic value, you need to stress the importance of planning. And yes, I love that image too. Uh, <laughs> The common complaint about creating media is that it's not serious work. If it's serious, it has to be text. Well, you need to set the expectation that you regard it as a rigorous academic activity. Well-designed and implemented media projects, they not only develop communication skills, but they're also excellent vehicles for developing skills in collaboration, in planning, and on organization. Let's have a look at the process that you'd use for creating a media project. Well, first off, you want to start by creating a rubric. You need to know, you need to let students know what's important. Uh, how important is it they be persuasive? Should they use a soundtrack and what sort of soundtrack? If they're using images, how effective are the images that they're using and how much do you value that? Secondly, just as in uh, a writing project, you need to stress research and determine, students need to determine what they want to say before starting out. A very important third step, and you see a small example of one there on screen, is uh, the importance of a storyboard. Just like you would plan a writing project, you need to plan a media project step by step using the format of a storyboard, which uh, if you want to grab a storyboard template there, just go to Google and, and you'll find um, hundreds of different examples across the web. Now fourthly, and this is where we start to incorporate writing in the media project, you must require them to have a script. Uh, if you've ever had a microphone thrust in front of you and, and been asked to speak spontaneously, you know how difficult that can be. A script is extremely important, and I'd put it in my rubric and make sure that that script and storyboard are actually submitted for approval before they even get a chance to start the media project. Fifth, you need to rehearse. A quality media project requires planning and rehearsal. Obviously, six, you go into uh, recording, but then importantly, you get to number seven, where you get to the post-production phase. After you've recording, you may go into editing, adding credits, soundtrack, all the different things that polish up the media project and make it available for final production. And lastly, and I'm a big advocate for sharing, uh, creating for an, an audience is very empowering for students. And so as part of the planning process, you want to make sure that we have a vehicle in place for them to be able to share their final media project. So 
So let's look at different types of video projects. And the first one, example I want to start out with is a little documentary. It's actually a public service announcement. And it's a wonderful example of uh, also the importance of media literacy. What you'll see here is um, a documentary project created by a fourth grade class. And actually, documentary is also, by the way, a perfect format for a student-centered research project. They require um, lots of research, collaboration, writing, presentation. It's actually a fantastic format to start out on a video project. Now, I want you to watch the following video very carefully. I'll play it for you. It's, uh, it's about um, global warming. And let me grab the link here for you so you'll be able to see it. And pay particular attention. Now, this, this group of students, before they created this video, did quite a bit of study of media literacy. And they, they spent the time and, and the energy to look at what makes a video effectively and uh, effective. And in their particular case, what makes a public service announcement effective. As you watch the video, note the sorts of techniques they use in the video um, that make it particularly strong and effective. And when we come back, I'll ask you to mention some of them. We need a talk. You should be ashamed of yourself. I'm really disappointed in you. You say you are going to protect me. You. You caused it. Now you have to stop it. You are polluting our air. You are making global warming worse. You. 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 You, 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 you cause it now. You have to stop it. Ice caps are melting. Water levels are rising. Your house could be underwater. Melting icebergs are raising sea levels. These animals are dying. Do you want your animals to die? Heat waves and droughts are an effect of global warming. When heat and cold come together, it makes a tornado. Cities and places can be wrecked by global warming. Everything you saw will happen if global warming keeps coming. He always you can fight global warming. Get in the car! Turn off your car when you're not using it for transportation. Eat more fruits and vegetables and eat less meat to cut down the pain in the atmosphere. Plants absorb carbon dioxide, so stop cutting trees and start planting them. Use fluorescent light bulbs. Look at this regular light bulb. It uses 100 watts, while this fluorescent one only uses 23. If you recycle more, less plastic, glass, and metals will be in our landfills, and those things will be reused. We need you to help fight global warming. So go to fightglobalwarming.com before it's too late. So I hope you enjoyed that. I think that's a, just a fantastic example of the power of using a media creation project uh, in, in any sort of learning format, but particularly in the case of a documentary. Now, uh, let's take a second and I, I'd like you to, if you can, just jot down in the chat room things that you notice, different techniques they used um, that made that an effective video. Uh, just go ahead and, and post your comments in the chat room so that we can discuss them. So you're all making excellent points there. And in, in going through them, you can see that uh, rather than a media project being something that's sort of a, a trivial throwaway, an alternative uh, activity to um, what you'd normally regard as learning in the classroom, it's actually, in this case, a particularly rigorous and very thorough academic activity. And it's taken the art of communication and made it an important part of the learning process. All the points that you've made here are extremely important parts of what make media effective. Uh, you'll notice that um, somebody mentioned the, the images. Images are constantly changing. They, they um, use about three to four seconds per image as they, they change them in order to keep your uh, attention. Notice the voices, constant changing of voices. It's not only great for collaboration, but uh, it keeps, again, it keeps your focus, your attention on what they're saying. 
uh, somebody mentioned, I think Peggy, that the uh, soundtrack, very dramatic, and uh, I'm sure that was an important part of their process in um, putting the media piece together. The consistent theme of you, well, they decided that they wanted to make this message very personal. And so not only did you constantly hear the words you, but you'd see the finger pointing and other things that made it clear that they were speaking directly at you. When they got to their to the latter part of the video and they wanted to stress the things you could do, they used text overlays um, for emphasis just to make sure that you, you not only heard it, but you could see exactly the points that they were making. So we can go on and there's, there's lots of different um, things they did, but uh, it also stresses the importance of media literacy, and I'll, uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll give you a couple of good resources um, to look up the theme of media literacy, and I encourage you to, whenever doing any sort of media project, to spend some time on media literacy, looking at the things that make media effective, and if possible, build it in as an, in, a, an integral and important part of your curriculum with students. Uh, as you can see, I mean, you would never send out uh, a, uh, a group of students and say, hey, write a five paragraph essay for me without thorough training in what that means and, and, and grammar and spelling and all the things that go into effective writing. Just as importantly, that sort of background and knowledge needs to be brought to, to the creation of media as well. Okay, here's another example. Similar to documenting, uh, creating a documentary, media can be a great vehicle for documenting learning. Now, some learning can be best demonstrated with video. As I said, we're very visual learners. It helps to be able to see something and not just hear about it or write about it. Uh, also, having created a video that can demonstrate learning, it's a great uh, vehicle for introspection. It, it allows us to review what we've learned. Now, this was a um, this actually was a project that was referenced in my iPad for uh, uh, iPad and Education for Dummies book. And it's from a teacher um, who's uh, actually a high school physics teacher. He's teaching his kids about relative motion uh, and something called frames of reference. Now, he could have given them a book and told them to read about it and then said, OK, now I want you to either answer these questions or write a short essay and describe to me what you understand about the topic of relative motion. But he very astutely recognized that it's something that is in, its, in and of its essence something very visual. So what he did is ask them to form groups and to go out and actually create a short video that demonstrated their understanding of the concept. Uh, it works extremely well. It's very effective. I'll let you take a look at it, and then we'll have a, a quick discussion of the technique that he's used um, to enable students to do this. Another great example, and again, there you can see that um, taking video is, a, is uh, and taking an annotating video is a tremendous vehicle for demonstrating learning, and it's something that I use with teachers quite often. Uh, just the technique of what he did there, the the um, process was that they took a video of um, themselves uh, actually demonstrating the uh, process of. Um, relative motion, and then what they did is with the video, and they they took the video actually with a. Um, an app by Vernia called Video Physics. And uh, you can actually take that video with uh, any video camera. You don't have to use a special app. But what they then did is take it and take stills from the video, pull them out of the video, annotate them, and then reinsert them with the annotations so that they could demonstrate the different things happening in the video. And I thought it worked extremely effectively. Now, here's a different example uh, where time lapse is a form of video that can be a wonderful method for understanding a concept. Now, as you probably understand, the thing about time lapse that's really great is that it enables you to capture a process that's a, over an extended period of time that you normally can't see with the naked eye. Uh, in this particular case, they set up a mobile device in front of a, uh, 
uh, a series of mung beans that they planted and watched them grow. And to be able to condense that, it was three days of growth down to uh, a few seconds, gives you an amazing insight into how they grew and again, a fantastic use of technology in order to demonstrate it. Uh, yeah, that is pretty wild. And um, the process of time lapse, uh, you wouldn't use it uh, all that often, but when you want to capture something over an extended period of time, it's very easy to do and it, the results are just fantastic. It enables you to visualize something that you wouldn't normally be able to see. Uh, in the, this particular case, I think they used an iPad and the iPad, there's different apps that you can use for time lapse video. If you go ahead and Google them, you'll find tons. Most of the animation apps have a time lapse feature that you can use for taking time lapse video. All you need to do is set uh, an interval and a duration. So you say, uh, you know, I want to take them for three days and an interval of, let's say, um, 60 seconds. And then I'll simply snap the photos and turn them into a video at the end. Uh, one process that has become quite popular in the last year that I use quite a lot with uh, students is green screen video. And the magic of green screen is it enables you to put, uh, or majors, ama enables a student to put themselves in a situation uh, within context of something that they're discussing or learning. Um, it's a process that up until, you know, just a few years ago was very expensive, uh, required professionals to do. Um, you know, if you look back at the old Superman movies, you know, they're using green screens and blue screens in order to, to make people fly. Well, the different things that they could do back then can now be achieved quite simply and easily with um, a few uh, relatively inexpensive materials and a, uh, an app that does green screens. So here you see an example from an app called Green Screen by Do Inc is the name of the company, D-O-I-N-K. Uh, and I'll show you in a sec how it's done, but you'll notice that the video is, has layers to it. And you'll notice this top layer here where the arrow is pointing. If you look closely, you'll see that the student is actually standing in front of a green screen. And the second layer underneath it is the background that replaces the green. And that's the process of green screen. It pulls, it pulls the color out and then it replaces it with any image that you put in the background. Uh, here's a project that I did with um, a fourth grade class, and this was a poetry project. They do the poetry project every year. Uh, and I sat down with the teacher and we decided we'd try it as a green screen project instead and turn it into a poetry recital. So as you look at, at the following project, note that what they've done is the student has created a piece of artwork that goes with their poem. They then recite the poem in front of a green screen and what they've done is replaced the green in the background with the artwork that they created. Now they took it a step further. Uh, what you'll see is that words pop up during the recital of the poem and they've taken those words, what the teacher asked them to do is take the sort of the, the, the crux of their poem, the central words that, that the S, the, form the essence of what they're saying and then pop them in on green in the background so you'll see them come up during the, uh, the actual video of the poetry recital. Feather Leaps by Neil. Turkey feathers, turkey feathers, falling to the ground, all in shades of yellow, red, orange, and brown. Rake them in a pile, jump until you find leaves in your hair and dirt in your eyes. Leaves are like turkey feathers, turkey feathers are like leaves. My friends like to play in piles of them. My Dad by Rena Soriano. My dad, he makes me happy. His cheeks are red and rosy. He makes me laugh. He is nice and plays with me all the time. So then you take a, a very simple, 
um, concept of writing a poem and you turn, can turn it into a poetry recital with a green screen and you can use green screens just in so many different ways. I've used them with um, uh, in a workshop with teachers so that um, they were weather reporters reporting the weather from a city in the, a different part of the world, creating historical videos where they're on location at different scenes in history. I really, as far as your imagine, imagination can take you, you can uh, often use green screens to create compelling videos in all sorts of learning situations. Uh, you can also, uh, and I'm glad somebody just uh, pointed out, they use Scratch to make animated backgrounds for the green screen. You don't just have to put an image in the background, you can put an animation in the background, you can put a video in the background. Uh, really, you can layer anything uh, in order to, to produce the final result. Now, somebody mentioned they wanted to do it in their class. I'll tell you the supplies you need. Um, the, what you're looking at here is really kind of the ultimate, and it looks like it's very expensive. It's actually $120 on Amazon, and that's if you want the entire kit and you really don't need it. Um, but the kit comes with a uh, green background there. You can see the, the green curtain in the background and the sets of lights. Uh, I recommend that you also use an external microphone uh, that's uh, probably run about fifty or sixty dollars. But if you don't have that sort of budget, and remember, you only need really one for the entire school. But if you don't have that sort of budget, then uh, easily what you can do is just take a sheet of green butcher paper, hang it up on the wall, just tape it up on a wall somewhere, and use that. You really don't need the lights if you've got decent lighting in your classroom, and you can create your green screen uh, set for as little as like you know five to ten dollars with some paper and and um, uh, just some nice lighting. So it doesn't have to be an expensive procedure. So just wrapping up video. Uh, some of the different apps that, that uh, we've discussed and used. Uh, iMovie, whether you're on an iPad or a, a uh, Mac, is great. There's uh, equivalent apps if you've got a Windows computer. Uh, we use the green screen app uh, on the iPad. You can also use um, most video editing apps will enable you to take out green screen. iMovie certainly does if you're on a Mac. Uh, good point uh, about the Android tablet. Yes, these do work. So most of these work on Android as well. Uh, certainly the green screen app does, and you've got uh, video editing apps on the Android as well. If you're looking for more professional effects, Tilt Shift Video is a nice app to look at. And if you're on a Chromebook and looking for something that works over the web, take a look at wevideo.com. It's a great website for creating video over the web. Now, as usual, I'm taking way too long and talking way too much, and I'm behind schedule, so I'm going to try and skip forward a little bit. We're going to take a quick look at animation. And I love using animation in class. There's different types of animation. Uh, you can do uh, what, what's called claymation or object-based animation. Uh, that's when you set up objects and you move them in between photos. If anyone's seen um, what's it, the Wallace and Gromit series is a great, um, a great example of claymation. It's uh, you just simply move the object, snap a photo, move the object, snap a photo, and so on. And that's how you create your animation. Now you can also do cutout animations where you, you do it on a flat surface and you can create different cutout images. If anyone's seen some of the Common Craft videos, they use that sort of a process. And you simply slide your cutout in as you take your video and animation and you create it that way. Uh, a third you can do also is cartoon animation. That tends to a little bit to be more towards the artistic, but it's a great, if you've got uh, students that are into that, it's also a great format for creating animation. Now, the thing I like about animation, there's several things that really make it conducive to learning. First off, a lot of what we learn can't be visualized um, that easily. With the, the help of animation, you can visualize processes that are normally invisible. Whenever I do workshops with um, teachers and I ask them to do animations, the sorts of topics they come up with are usually that sort of a topic, something like photosynthesis, electricity, things that you can't normally see, but you can create a, a uh, visual representation of it through the process of animation. Uh, it's also great for conceptualizing abstract notions and critical analysis. The thing about animation is you've actually got to break a process down into its component steps. So anything that can be broken down into steps uh, and then can be uh, turned into video, very, um, very conducive to animation. They're great for collaboration because obviously in animation you've got different people moving objects, taking videos, writing scripts, so they're great for group work. And trust me, once you start an animation, an animation process with kids, 
uh, it becomes extremely difficult to actually end that lesson. It's fantastic uh, for engagement and, and really deep learning because they, they really get involved in it. Let's take a look at one fantastic example uh, of an animated project. Now, I'm actually going to talk over the top of this video. Um, can somebody just point out if you can hear me right now? Great. So what this teacher did is um, she had them create a story, write a story, and then she wanted them to create a complete visual representation of a story. If she, she wanted to see them to see if they could actually tell the story visually through the process of animation. Uh, and I think the results are, are great here, and you, it's a fantastic example of the potential of using animation in class. Uh, looking at different apps, and I've noted here iPad apps, but there are apps you can use on PCs and Chromebooks as well, and MacBooks. Um, two apps that I like to use, Animated, which is also uh, available on laptops, and iStop Motion, which is again also available on uh, different laptops and formats, and Androids as well. And next topic that I want to deal with very quickly is eBooks. They are just a fantastic alternative to the standard written project. Um, most books today, most e-books today, are, are pretty much just standard PDF versions of a, a printed book. Uh, with the, the aid of a digital device, you can actually create very multimedia, multimodal, interactive e-books. And that's what we want to focus on here. It's the perfect vehicle to combine and, and distribute projects that contain all different uh, sorts of media, whether they be audio, video, and so on. Some examples of ebooks. Well, here's an example where one teacher here thought it was a fantastic vehicle for enabling kids to use sign language within a book. So she had the kids, uh, she had two classes that one was at a school for the deaf and the other one was a, a uh, high school learning uh, sign language. And so she had the kids write a story. The kids from the, the uh, lower school, the school, school for the uh, hearing impaired, they actually created the images for the book. And then the kids would sign the text on the pages of the book. And as you leaf through it, you can play the uh, actual sign language portions on the video here on, right directly on the page and, and see the text in sign language as well. That's so funny. I see somebody there. Peggy's mentioning the Invertebrates book, which uh, actually we're about to take a look at in a sec. Uh, here's an example of creating a math textbook. Uh, this, uh, this teacher, Kathy, Kathy Yenka, um, they took different approaches to the solving of math problems. She encouraged kids to come up with their own approaches. And then she had them, they came up with such wonderful ideas that she had them create a textbook out of it. On the left there, you'll see that what she's done is use an app called Explain Everything, and they've um, actually demonstrated the process of solving a particular math problem. Uh, on the right, they've written some tips and put it together in the format of an e-book, which we then can produce. Uh, Sophie asks, how can we do this? Uh, the apps that we used here, one was called Explain Everything, and that you see on the left there to create the video. You can actually, it's called a screencasting app. You can interact with the screen so you can write and talk at the same time and turn it into a movie. And then the, the uh, book is put together, as we'll see in a second, with an app called Book Creator, which is a wonderful app for um, mobile devices. Um, here's a little project that I did with uh, some kindergarten kids. And they were studying animals. The teacher had them uh, come up with five interesting facts about an animal of their choice. Uh, we used a, um, a very silly but uh, effective app here on the left called Chatterpix, and it's one of those apps where you can 
actually draw a line across the mouth and, and then you, you speak something. You, as you talk, the mouth moves in conjunction with the audio. Uh, so the kids um, actually spoke their facts um, using the Chatterpix app. It then turned it into a little video. We then came over to Book Creator here on the right and they put uh, their video on the page and we turned it into a class ebook about different animals. And lastly, this uses a, an authoring tool called iBooks Author. And it's one that you can uh, use on a MacBook. It's a little more sophisticated, but it has um, just uh, tremendous capabilities for producing really interactive and powerful ebooks. And this particular teacher, Callie, uh, they were studying uh, life sciences and she took them out into the field. She took them to the, uh, to the beach where they looked up different um, tide pools and animals in the tide pools and they created videos out on location. Then they came back and uh, created the book and embedded these videos within the book itself, turned it into a wonderful ebook which they then were able to distribute. And as I mentioned, the two apps that I use quite extensively for creating ebooks, and they're not the only apps that you can use, but if you're on a mobile device, uh, uh, the Book Creator app is just wonderfully easy to use and uh, enables you to very quickly and easily put together ebooks with different media formats. If you're looking for something more powerful and you've got a MacBook or a, a, an, an iMac available to you, then the iBooks Author program is one that you want to look at there as well. Now we're reaching the end of our session today and as I promised, I wanted to take a look at augmented reality. Uh, those of you that have a mobile device with you and have the Dacry app that uh, was recommended, D-A-Q-R-I, I'm going to ask you to pull that out in a sec. Now what augmented reality is, is it's, a, it's a, a, in essence it's another way for packaging different media for consumption. Just like an e-book enables you to put together text and video and audio in a format that can be distributed and viewed by others, uh, augmented reality is the same sort of vehicle. Now the difference here, and it's a big difference, is that augmented reality allows you to layer digital information, digital media, over something you're looking at. Uh, let me show you the, the very quick and obvious example where it's used, and that's in a museum format. Now you're all, all probably familiar with um, the sorts of headsets that you walk around the museum, the little Walkmans they used to be, and uh, you'd listen to information about different artists and you'd have to press a button and then listen to it. Well, with augmented reality, you can use a device and an app like Daiquiri, and you can then use it to look at something and it recognizes the image you're looking at and can play a piece of media. So it recognizes this, in this case, the image that's hanging on the wall. Yes, Sophia, Erasmus, another one. Uh, there's se several different augmented reality apps. Um, but you point it at the image and then when it sees it, it recognizes it and plays the image on your device. Now, if you have Daiquiri, go ahead and open it up now. And Point at the image that you see on screen. Give it a few seconds. It may need to download something. But open up the Daiquiri app until you can see it's got a camera on it and you can turn the camera around and look at different things in your room. And then go ahead and focus it on the image on screen. Like I said, give it about four or five seconds. And if somebody wants to post in the chat room if and when hopefully it's working for you, what do you see? So as, as a couple of people have noted, what you should start seeing is a video and it's actually, you'll notice there's a fork in the road here. Uh, yes, go ahead and just click to start. Somebody asked the question there, do I click start? You go ahead, click start and just point your camera at the image. And what it is is actually, uh, it's a style of um, animation and video called RSA animation. And you'll notice the image is a, an image of a fork in the road and it's an analysis of actually a, a uh, actually a retelling of the poem, a visual retelling of the, the poem um, that corresponds to the image. It's the road not taken. So how do you use augmented reality in class? What's the, um, the benefit of something like this? Well, I've done several augmented reality, uh, several augmented reality projects with different classes and schools and it's a tremendously powerful vehicle. Uh, what you can do is, uh, with one school we had a cultural exhibit. Um, they created a museum in the main hall. They invited about 400 parents and community members in. They created um, actual 
artifacts uh, of different periods of history and uh, different um, artifacts that represented the culture at the time. Uh, so it might be a temple, it might be um, an, an image of war or something that they created with an art teacher. They put little plaques underneath the exhibits and then they had people download an app, come in and point their app at the plaque in front of the, uh, each individual exhibit. It then played a video that the students had created telling a little bit about the exhibit and the significance of that part of the uh, culture. So um, you can go different ways with it. I had another class that created Mardi Gras masks. They were studying Brazil and the different aspects of the culture of Brazil and they created different Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras masks representing different aspects of the culture. Again, turned it into a museum and created videos that went with the masks and were triggered by little plaques that they put in front of them. Uh, you can become creative and do something like a uh, what we learned this week uh, image outside your classroom wall, uh, your classroom door. You have students create a little documentary video about what you learned in class that week and anybody walking past your classroom can point a device at the image on the door and get a little video, a short 60 second video about what the students learned that week. Uh, so. Um, oh, another, another one uh, that's great, I've seen it used in a library for student book reviews. Uh, you take the cover of a book and you point your, your device at it and it plays a uh, student re book review that's associated with the cover of that particular book. So there's all different applications you can use it for. Now those of you that didn't manage to get it working, I'll give you another chance here on the next one. Here's another um, great example of it. Go ahead and point your device at this one. And this is, uh, the students are studying a, a period in history, it was actually I think World War II that they were studying. They found some actual letters from uh, soldiers in World War II and they uh, created a little exhibit around them and part of which was the letter and if you point your device at it you'll hear the student actually reciting the letter. Uh, so hopefully you managed to, to get that working and some, some of you are able to, to view that uh, letter and hear the, the student actually reciting it. Uh, Sophia, if you want to hang around afterwards, I'll, I'll be happy to uh, step you through it and help you solve any technical problem that you had. So we're running up against uh, time, so I want to uh, quickly sum up. Uh, now the book itself, by the way, uh, again coming back to the uh, Creating Media book, uh, Creating Media for Learning book that I've written. Uh, the, the website for that is creatingmedia.org and the book itself features a number of different projects just like the ones you've seen today. The images in the book are enabled for augmented reality, so you can point your device at the printed page in the book and it will play the, pro the student media project that you're reading about right there on the page. Uh, so that's uh, an extremely unique feature of the book. Uh, before we wrap up, I want to quickly, um, there's some augmented reality apps, Orasma and Daiquiri. Uh, I want to quickly give you a couple of um, uh, links that you want to look at for media literacy, which we discussed earlier. The Center for Media Literacy is a great resource, as is the National Association for Media Literacy Education. So it's medialit.org or namla.net. Uh, strongly encourage you to look at those and to build media literacy into your curriculum, whether it be into your individual class or even better would be into the, uh, the school curriculum. And lastly, before we leave, it, uh, it's, change is never easy. Um, tackling different technologies that you may be not familiar with, I mean we looked at augmented reality, animation, different video techniques, it's not always easy but the question is, is, is it conducive to learning and how will it help students? Uh, so sometimes taking that risk and leaping off to try something different um, can be tremendously rewarding. Uh, it's very easy to get stuck in what you do and do the same thing over and over every year, but I strongly encourage you to, to take that risk. Uh, you'll learn a lot, of, a lot along the way yourself and you'll give students just tremendous opportunity to learn and grow by giving them tools that they can use for that. Thanks for attending. Uh, again, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, uh, would like to contact me for anything, I, uh, I'm happy to hear from you. Thanks very much for attending and I think we've almost run out of time but hopefully we've got a couple of minutes left for some questions uh, if you have any as well. Thanks very much. Yes, Sam, I did capture some questions. Uh, for the public service announcement, did the students actually do the editing? 
Yes, they did. Uh, they used I'm, uh, iMovie on a MacBook, and I'm mm -hmm. sure they, they had some help from the teacher, but yes, I believe they did do the editing. How much time did the video take to make? I, I can't speak done? to that one. I wasn't, I wasn't involved in it. Time. Okay. Okay. I wasn't involved in the actual video creation of that, that particular project, but I can tell you as a general mm -hmm. rule, um, mm -hmm. allow yourself definitely um, you know, at least the same amount of time for planning as you do for actually creating the video. Mm -hmm. And usually I, I would think anywhere between like four and eight lessons for creating anything of decent quality. And hopefully if you've got mm -hmm. time for longer, that would be great. One of the problems I always run into, and it's really unfortunate, is teachers just constantly being stressed by the pressure to get through a curriculum. Right. Uh, sort of being, having to go and, and address more and more topics rather than being able to slow down and actually go into to greater depth. But if you can, that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. And likely same, same reasoning as far as knowing where it was created. Was it done in a classroom or in a media class? Do you know? Yeah, you're talking about the uh, public service announcement? Yes, yes. Uh, both. You can see that there are some shots taken outside, outdoors mm -hmm. and the, the rest were done in class. So it was obviously a combination of the two. Okay. okay. And I think this was, this question was answered after um, the question was asked. But as far as the green screen apps, there are apps for Android and PC, right? Yes, there are. Um, if you're talking about PC, um, most quality video editing apps have um, the ability to, to actually draw out any color, so mm -hmm. whether it be green or blue or anything else. Um, and you've got a lot of the apps that we discussed on the iPad are also available on Android. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, is there still no green screen feature in the iMovie iPad app? It was a question. There is not in the iMovie iPad app. There is in iMovie on the Mac. Um, mm -hmm. On the on the, um, I'm sure they'll get it at some point in the iPad. But for now, it's just a fantastic alternative, and I think actually a far more effective way of doing it is through that app that I highlighted. That's called Green Screen. Green Screen by Doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that link's already been shared. Um, is it difficult or easy for beginners to make the augmented reality starting pieces? Can elementary students do it? Well, see, so the thing about augmented reality is um, it's the augmented reality piece is tacked on at the end. So what you do is you create mm -hmm. your, your media piece, your video. You then have to create a little trigger image. Once that's done, and any class can do that, once that's done, you have to associate the trigger image and the video using an augmented reality app. And that's often okay. uh, that, that is done either by the teacher or the teacher in conjunction with the students. Mm -hmm. um, but you can, you can get an app, and then once all, that, all the media has been created, it's a pretty simple process once you see how it's done to actually associate the, the images and the video together. Do you have a recommended app to link the creation and the trigger image? Uh, I use either Aurasma, A-U-R-A-S-M-A, or Dacry, D-A-Q-R-I, which is the one we use today. Mm -hmm. And is the uh, signing students ebook in the is is that in the live binder for today? Somebody asked about the link for that. Uh, uh, is that a question for me? Because I'm not sure. Uh, I think it was. Um, question was, where can I see the actual project done with the students? DHH hard of hearing. Uh, I'm not sure that that's publicly available. I actually, it was in my book, and I worked okay. with, with the teacher that created it, so I don't know that she, if, if she's made that publicly available. I see. OK. OK. We still have people who want to try out the AR for themselves uh, on the slide. So. Uh, would you like me to go back to it? Uh, yeah, one was, it, one, one person didn't, it didn't matter what the image was, either the the story or the poetry. So you just want to bring the, the Daiquiri app up so that you've got the camera showing. You should be able to move the, the device around and see the camera showing you whatever you're looking at. 
when you've got that, then go ahead and point it at that image. It'll take a few seconds, depending on your bandwidth. It may take a few seconds for the media to download, and then you should be able to see it. Yes, that note that was just there is exactly what I would do. In fact, I, I just mm -hmm. had a, a uh, session with some teachers this week, and that's exactly what we decided to do. Um, they were doing a similar project. We decided that they should down, uh, have a look at some videos, get some, some ones, actually some ones that they thought were really good, and maybe some ones that weren't as good. Mm -hmm. Look for the, the elements in there that, um, that, that sort of improve the quality of the video and see if they could then apply that to the work they were doing. And in the case of the ones that weren't as good, maybe look at things that could have been done that would have improved the quality of the video. So yeah, I definitely recommend that process before you, you create the video. Great. Those are the questions that I was able to capture that were not answered as, as you presented. So thanks so much. I think I'm about ready to turn the mic over to. Uh, I was just going to mention that anybody, once we switch off this slide, if you want to try augmented reality um, on, the crea on the book website, creatingmedia.org, there's a page there where it tells you how to do it, and it'll show you an example, and you can try it out there as well. Oh, great. Again, Sam, thank you. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy. Thank you so much, Sam. You've given us so many great ideas to explore. And I happen to know that they're all and much, much more in your book. And I'm so excited that I have it on my Kindle and that I can actually access all of those videos using my, my Daiquiri app. So thanks a lot. We do have some great shows coming up that we'd love to invite all of you back to. Next Saturday, we get to hear from Billy Krakauer and Sharon Plant on using tech to engage students with disabilities. We're really looking forward to that. On February 27th, we're going to have another open mic show with Paula Nagel. And we're going to be talking about board games, all kinds of games, card games, dice games, and ways you can incorporate it, them in the classroom, both techie and non-techie things. And then on March 5th, Eric Kurtz is going to be with us. And he's going to be talking about um, uses for Google Drawings in your classrooms. So that'll be something we'll really enjoy learning more about. And then we're going to have Participate Learning with Brad Spears on March 12th, and on March 26th, we're going to get some updates on what's going on with Remind.com and some of the amazing new features they've added. So we hope you'll come back every Saturday and join us. And thanks a lot. Lori, you can take us out. All right, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD re resources in one place, including host your own webinar. And with that series, you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as you make the session public, it is free. You can also nominate a featured teacher for a, a month. There's a form link here. But you also can fill out the form from the Live Binder each month. You can nominate yourself as well for featured teacher. As you exit the session, the survey should open up. This is the URL for the survey, or you can take it from the chat box. It's also in the Live Binder in that Resources tab at the end. At the very bottom of the survey, you can ask for a professional development certificate. It now prints up with your name. But please use a personal email address for this request. Schools tends to block it. The archives are also in a video collection and audio collection on iTunes U, as well as an RSS feed on the Classroom 2.0 Live website. You can also get the full recording from the website. Again, special thanks to Sam Glicksman, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming.